Good morning, church families. We continue to worship. I'm going to encourage you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Joshua this morning. We take a little bit of a detour as we celebrate our seniors this Sunday morning. On this Senior Sunday, uh, church family, would you join me in, in celebrating God's faithfulness to our seniors this morning and to their families? Chapel Choir, thank you for leading us so beautifully this morning. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 is, I think, a timely word to our seniors. I want to speak specifically to our seniors so much so that uh, this is a message that, that is, is timely. It's got an expiration date. It's an expiration date of this service right now. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. I've titled this message, As You Go, Don't Forget. As you go, don't forget. I don't think many of you would recognize this picture here. This is Leela Burton. This is in 2017, Booker T. Washington Public School graduation ceremony. And in 2017, Leela Burden, she received her high school diploma. Now, as you can see, as she was going across the stage here, uh, for our 17-year-old and 18-year-old seniors, she's got a couple of years on you, actually 93 years to be exact. She, at the time of this picture, was 111 years old when she received her high school diploma. In 2017, she was interviewed after receiving her high school diploma, and she said, I I'm not old yet, I'm still a young lady. Our seniors now have gone through a COVID shutdown. Leela Burden, in 1918, went through a school shutdown, which was the flu pandemic. She, at that time, was, uh, ended up working two jobs, and she never went back to school. And so in 2017, she said, I still have my aches and pains, but thank God I'm still alive. Now, Leela Burden, at the time of her high school graduation, had in all practical purposes, she had all of her life in the rearview mirror. She had her life behind her. And you graduates, you, as you will go in these coming days through this momentous occasion of receiving your high school diploma and beginning this new chapter of your life, you, for all practical purposes, you have your life in front of you here. And I'm reminded of a famous doctor, um, Dr. Seuss, that is, uh, Oh, the places you will go. Today's your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You're off to the new chapter of your life, the next chapter of your life. You will study. You will make lifelong friends. You will prepare for a career. You will grow. You will have experiences that will shape you. This will be a formative season in the years to come. And what do you need to hear as you come to this pivotal moment, as you go, don't forget. Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 1, reads, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. Joshua chapter 1 is a transitional chapter in the story of the Israelites here. It's the passing of the baton of leadership from the death of Moses in the preceding chapter in the preceding book of Deuteronomy right there. As we come to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, we have the baton of leadership going to Moses' assistant, Joshua. Uh, the first line of Joshua chapter 1 is a pivotal line after the death of Moses. And so you have this moment in the Israelites' history as he's been leading them, wandering through the wilderness, out of Egyptian captivity. All of their story is wrapped up into this one leader here. And so you can imagine the apprehension that the people of God would have had at this moment of his death. That there's nothing but questions before them as they're going into the promised land. Is Joshua up to the task? Uh, uh, can, can we actually get to this place right here? What will this actually be like here? 
And as God's word spoke to the Israelites then, I think God's word speaks to this pivotal season in your life also. In Joshua chapter 1, we see that you go as Joshua did. He went with the promise of God's presence. And you go with the promise of God's presence. Notice in verse 5 of Joshua chapter 1, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Notice the refrain again in verse 9, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And so if there's a word to hear in this time of transition for our graduates that are headed to the next chapter of your life, it's this word that we hear in verse 5 and verse 9. Do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Whatever this next chapter is going to look like for you, God's word to the people of God then is God's word to us, the people of God, now. And, and God, like a, a, a parent who is trying to emphasize something, and you remember when you were three, and you remember when you were four, and your parents would sit you down, and they would say something to you. And just to make sure you understood, they, they would say it again, and they would say it again. Why? Because they wanted you to get that point. That repetition That reiteration was something that that showed an importance here. And so God, he reiterates what is important. Do not forget that wherever you go, I'm going to be there with you. Now, no one in this room who is a high school senior is going into the promised land. I mean, this is not your story here, but it is your story in the sense that God is with you as you go into the next chapter of your life. And one of the reoccurring themes that we see in Scripture is this this theme of God's presence with us. He's almost always saying to the people of God, don't forget I'm with you. Don't forget I'm with you. Don't forget I'm with you. He said it to Isaac in Genesis chapter 26. He says it to Jacob in Genesis chapter 31. He says it to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. He says it to Joshua here in Joshua chapter 1. And Jesus, before he ascends into heaven, he says it to the disciples. Lo, behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. And so this theme is a theme that that grounds us, that God goes with us wherever we go as Christians. It's probably eight years ago now. Seven years ago, it was a Memorial Day weekend. I'm reminded of this. We have this photo thing in our kitchen that just shows you know, eight years ago, this is what we were doing. Seven years ago, five years ago. And so I saw some pictures of when the boys were really young before we lived here in Birmingham. It was a Memorial Day weekend. We went to a water park in Baton Rouge. I think Jonathan, our youngest son, was about three years old. And I remember so vividly being there because Hayden and Luke were old enough to where they could just kind of roam the park and go on any of the rides. I mean, they had, they had no height restrictions. There were no weight restrictions. The, the park w- was theirs to behold and to do. But Jonathan, he was three. And so me or Danielle had to be with him on all the rides. But he's three years old, and he's got these two older brothers. And so at first, he was a little tentative going on the rides. But as it goes on, he, he, he gets really, really confident. And so we're going up you know, the steps to one of the rides. And he turned around, and he goes, Dad, I've got this. I've got this. You don't have to go. Daddy, let me, let me do this. Let me do this. And so what he didn't know... Yes, he was confident to ride it. Yes, he got comfortable with the rod. But what he didn't know was is the only way that he could ride that rod is because I was with him. Because there were these height regulations. And the only way that you had an exception, an exemption to that height regulation was that you were with a parent. So the only way that he had access to the rod was with me by his side. And it's true for you, graduates, that as you go, you're going to be climbing steps. And as you go, you're going to be going places, and you're going to be making a name that is a name that is, is worthy of respect, and it is, it is worthy of the hard work that you're putting into your life, and God is going with you, and you know this, but, but do not forget that, that your intellect is not enough, your hard work ethic is not enough, your charisma and charm, they're not enough, that for what God is calling you to do, You have to have him by your side, and you will be tempted, as a three-year-old is tempted, to look to his father, to look to his mother and say, I've got this. Let me do it by myself. You too will be tempted to do that. We all are tempted to do that. We're all tempted to say to our father, hey, I got it. 
Give me some space. But your heavenly Father, as you say to him through disobedience and as you say to him through neglect that I've got this with my life, he never leaves you. Even in your disobedience, he doesn't leave you. And any time that you turn to him in repentance and confession, guess what? He is there to receive you. And so as you go in your obedience and your disobedience, he is there by your side. As you go, wherever you go, he is there by your side. So you go with the promise of God's presence. But also this morning, you go with the prescription for true success. You hear a lot about success, especially as a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old. You hear a lot about what it means to live a successful life. Listen to this prescription of true success In Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, only be strong and very courageous, God says to Joshua. Being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law, verse 8, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. Well, those are, those are words to hear for a high school graduate, are they not? They're, they're words for here to, to, for any adult that is here, any child that is here. Uh, obey the word of God and you will find success in life. Now, it's interesting. They're going into the promised land. There's going to be opposition. They've got to fight their way with God by their side to take the land that he has promised. And notice what God doesn't tell Joshua. He doesn't say anything about military strategies here. He doesn't give him a a sort of a a, a side life lesson, leadership insights here. He doesn't say anything about the weak points of of the foes that he's going to be facing here. He gives Joshua and the people of God what matters the most in that moment. That you will find success wherever you go when you obey the word of God. Now, this is not the world's definition of success. I don't think at times it's Christian's definition of success. We think of success as upper mobility. We, we think of success as achievement. Our society, it markets aggressively the idea that you're only successful when you get into, and you can just start filling the blanks. You get into the right school, and then you rush the right fraternity or sorority, you choose the right major, you get into the right graduate program, you land the best internship, you work your way up the corporate ladder, you make enough money, and you buy things to show people just how successful you are. Now, listen to me. A a lot of those things are, are good things. And praise God that we live in a day and age that we can we can apply ourselves in such a way. And we can receive the blessings of living in a society like this society now that has the freedom to be able to to achieve in in great ways Uh, across this world. So many people are, are literally dying to have these kinds of experiences. So many of these steps, there's nothing inherently wrong with them. But understand me, you can you can check off all of these markers of success. And you can step up one rung of the ladder and go to the next rung of the ladder and go to the next rung of the ladder and spiritually be empty. Spiritually, you can be restless. Jesus would say it this way, for what does it profit for a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? So Mark chapter 8 is not just a word for 2,000 years ago. It is a word that intersects every parent in this room, every teenager in this room, every one of us that's in this room. There are decisions that we make. There is no such thing from the word of God as true success without God being at the very center of your life. And you don't even have to be a Christian to recognize this. It's interesting, every year, Around graduation time, you, you will see a, what, what has been called the most famous commencement address ever given. And it was given by David Foster Wallace. David Foster Wallace was a renowned essayist, a novelist, 
whose uh, death was, was, was tragic in, in so many ways uh, almost two decades ago. In 2005, he delivered this commencement address to Kenyon College. David Foster Wallace is, is, is no, he, he was not a believer, he was not a Christian, but he had tremendous insight. And he, and he spoke to something to these college graduates that still, it rings with truth. He says, this I submit is the freedom of real education, of learning how to be well-adjusted. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. You get to decide, notice what he says, you get to decide what to worship. In the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. Do you hear what he's saying? That, that, that all of us are worshipers. The, the question isn't for the 17-year-old whether will they worship or not worship. It's who will they worship? What will they worship? It's not a question for you as a parent or a grandparent of one of these graduates of whether you will worship or not. It is what you are worshiping, who you are worshiping here. And so the question to answer in the next chapter of the lives of our high school graduates is the question that matters at the very heart of our life. Joshua is telling us in Joshua chapter 1, there's only one who is worthy of our worship. There's only one, if we set our eyes upon him, will we truly then live a successful life. This is the Old Testament version. If you've got your Bible, you can write in Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, you can write in the margin that that Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, that's the parallel to this passage right here. Old Testament, kiss and cousin to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So what is Joshua saying is is how we worship him. He says, well, meditate on the word of God and obey the word of God. If you want to find abundance and you want to find success in life, you you meditate upon the word of God. And we think of meditation oftentimes in sort of Eastern religions, the emptying of one's mind, the stealing of the, as Henry Nouwen talks about, the stealing of the monkeys that, that just swing on the branches of, of our mind here. And, 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 and Jen Wilkin, in, in a wonderful book, uh, talks about that meditation isn't the emptying of one's mind. It's rather, and you see it on the screen here, Christian meditation is the feeling of the mind for the purpose of obedience, the purpose of acting. It's a means of learning by repeated exposure to the same ideas that involve study, reflection, and rumination. It's just this wonderful reminder. We are shaped by what we savor. We are shaped by what we savor. And do we savor the word of God? Do we savor obedience to God? What what we delight in as 17-year-olds, what we delight in as 47-year-olds, it ultimately defines us. So what we savor shapes us. What we delight in, it defines us. What we worship and who we worship is who we actually are. And as, as, as high school graduates headed to this next chapter of life, I, I just remind you of the Word of God here. To mull over the Word of God, to consult the Word of God, to study the Word of God, to obey the Word of God, to pursue the Word of God. And not just individually, but as you, as you head off to your freshman year and as you head off to the next chapter of life, whatever that is, whether it's college or, or something else here, notice that to pursue the Word of God is, is, is the path to true success. And don't do that alone. Do that in the community. One question that I will always ask you. I will see you when you come back for Christmas. I will see you when you come back in summer. And I'm going to ask a question like this. How are you doing? But I'm also going to really quickly ask. So tell me about the church that you're involved in. So don't be sort of this nomad who just, just ranges for four years in this season of life. But plant yourself. Find a church that teaches the Word of God. Find a church that's mission-minded and evangelistic. Find a church that's got a variety of ages. You don't need to be in a church that's just got people that look like you and are the same age of you. Look around and you want to see gray hair in that church. You want to see people younger than you. And then get there and plant there and serve there. 
and learn. And don't, don't think of this four years as sort of this wilderness that you're just going to, to wander. But no, plant yourself. And as you grow, because some of the most formative decisions that you're going to make are going to be made in the next four to five to six to seven to eight years that are ahead of you. They will, they will shape and define the decades that are before you. So don't do that alone. Do that in the community of God, with the people of God, and the Word of God grounding you and shaping you. Savor it because it will shape you. Delight in it because it will define you here. And here's the promise of the passage. That when you're shaped by the Word of God, you will find success. I mean, is this, is this like an Old Testament Ponzi scheme here? That if you do this, then up, up, and away. And, and the answer to that is no. Actually, the words in verses 7 and 8 in the Old Testament, they, they rarely, if ever, in the Old Testament refer to financial success. They, 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 they refer to holiness and obedience. The successful life is the one that is shaped by the Word of God and looks like the image of God. So the successful life is the Word of God shaping us and molding us. And then wherever we go and whatever we do, we look more like Him. And whether that says an architect, that says a teacher, if that says a coach, or if that's in the profession of law or medicine, it says a counselor or a social worker, a pastor or a missionary, a professor. You know, what, wherever you go, as you're obedient to his word, he's, he's shaping you and he's molding you. And, and you live a life of success because you're living a life in his will and for him. You'll come home. In spring break, you'll come home in the summer. And one thing that you can do is you can go to church here, and uh, on, throughout the week you can, you can scoot down just a few uh, feet from our church and go to Saul's Barbecue. When I first moved here, a lot of people took me to Saul's. And they said, hey, we want to take you to a unique barbecue place here. We think you'll love it. And, and I, I found over the last five years that I find myself at Saul's. Now, one of the things about Saul's, if you've ever been to Saul's, it's a wonderful barbecue place. But for those of you that have been there, you know this. It's, you know, it's a small place. And so if you walk in there and you sit down in there and you eat there, you will, for the rest of the day, smell like Saul's. You, you will be fully immersed. You will be baptized in the smoke of Saul's. I mean, so much so that I can come home hours later after having met someone at lunch there, and Danielle can, she can, she can smell me as I walk in. And she'll say, you went to Saul's today, didn't you? And the only way you're going to get that smell out of it, I mean, the only way really is you've got to, you've got to take that, that sports coach, you've got to take those paint, you've got to take it to the dry cleaners. You do, because it immerses you in the smell. And so as you go, as you go, don't forget what is essential. Immerse yourself in the Word of God. Immerse yourself in obedience to God. So that when you go to this next chapter and you're with new friends and, and you're around new professors and you're, you get close to, to roommates, they, they, they will say something like this, I, I don't know what it is, but I can smell something about this person. And what they will smell is the sweet aroma of Jesus Christ. So as you go, go with the promise of God's presence. And as you go, high school graduates, go with the prescription for true success. Let us pray.